This morning, I want to return to a study that we were doing, and maybe conclude that this morning, of some evils that Christ saw in the lives of the people. While Christ was on this earth, he certainly saw a lot of good things in the lives of people, but he also saw a lot of things that were evil. We've looked at some of those evil things, for example, in the life of Herod. He saw the aspect of selfishness. Uh, he, in the life of his mother and father, he saw carelessness in their life uh, as they dealt with him. <clears throat> he saw an appreciation uh, in the lives of his neighbors, so much so that it caused him to say, A prophet is not without honor save in his own country and in his own house. <clears throat> he saw insincerity in the conduct <clears throat> of some of his professed followers as they followed him for the food instead of for his teaching, John the sixth chapter. <clears throat> he saw partyism and ceremonialism in the religious life of the Pharisees as we see in Matthew, the 23rd chapter. And our service to God certainly must come from the heart as we are to love Him with all of our being. And we are to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And we certainly obey the gospel, at form the gospel from the heart. And so it takes that in relationship to our salvation and in our Christian life and conduct. <clears throat> He saw self-righteousness paraded in the lives of the Pharisees, uh, causing him to set forth that parable of one who, a Pharisee who went and prayed, I'm thankful that I'm so great. I'm so wonderful. I'm not even like this publican over here as opposed to the publican who would not so much lift up his eyes to heaven and said, the Lord be merciful unto me, a sinner. He saw betrayal in the life of one of his close associates, the life of Judas. And in the trials that he underwent, he saw lying in the testimony of the false witnesses as they misrepresented what he said. But also our Lord saw crookedness of politics and the judgment of Pilate. When you turn over to Matthew, the 27th chapter, and we begin at verse 17 and go through verse 26, it says, Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, What will you, or Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he had, was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, whether the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate then said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they said, or they all said unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But he cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail, or that he could prevail nothing, but that a, rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. It's been rightly stated that statesmen follow the course of what is right. Politicians 
pursue the course of popularity. Sometimes we express it as they, you know, lick their finger and stick it up in the air to see which way the wind's blowing. When you look at Pilate, he knew that Jesus was a just man. He states it here. Done nothing wrong. What evil has he done? In fact, he asked the people. They couldn't tell him anything. His wife sent a message. Have nothing to do with that no, it's a just man. He was just. Everything that Pilate knew, he was just. He had done nothing wrong, nothing worthy of death, and he knew that the only reason that he was there was the envy of the religious leaders. And yet, what's he going to do? Instead of following the course of what is right, now what was right is, man who's just, who's done nothing wrong, you release him. We all know that. That's the right thing to do. But here's the crowd out here yelling at him, crucify him, crucify him. What's he to do? Well, he stuck his finger up in the air and saw the wind of the people. And so he tried, he made an attempt to wash his hands from the whole situation. I'm free of the blood of this just man. Again, he refers to him as a just man. Go ahead and do whatever you want with him. That's the politician that was in Pilate. Satisfy the people instead of doing what is right. And you might, if you wanted to emphasize that even a little bit more, Pilate, being the Roman governor, had the power of the Roman government behind him. If he had released Jesus, there's the Roman government saying, okay, that's it. And the Jews would have been able to do nothing about it. But he didn't. He just capitulated to the desires of the people. That's a good politician, but it's not a good statesman. Because he very simply succumbed to the pressure and the methods of the Jewish people instead of doing what's right. We see this in the church as well, though. There's a lot of elders and elderships that just simply follow the will of the people. They're not out leading. Now, several years ago, and uh, well, Dave Miller has never repented over this. In fact, he continues to defend it, even though the congregation where it took place, the elders there repented of it. And yet they still have fellowship. I haven't figured that one out yet. But there was the reaffirmation re, or reevaluation, reaffirmation of elders. If the elders get 75% approval rating, then they'll remain an elder. But if he doesn't get 75%, then he has to resign. All that is is an eldership giving leadership over to the congregation instead of being the leaders of the congregation. And the pressure of the people then, not even all of them, just 25%, removes an elder. The pressure of the congregation over the elders. But in reality, 
this has been done not just in that situation, that's a good illustration, as to pressure methods in relationship to the elders, and elders, instead of leading the flock, they become the followers of the flock. And if they continue to practice that, Brown Trail practiced it twice, the second time is when they repented of it, if they continue to do it, though, then what's the elders going to do? Well, I've got to keep 75% of the people happy with me, or else I'll get thrown out. Politicians in the church. That's just an illustration, though. We have politicians in the church all of the time, not always in the eldership even. A lot of times, members are politicians because they want to satisfy the most people that they can. And they think that by satisfying and giving in to others, that somehow that's going to cause the church to grow. Instead of standing for what is truth and what is right, no matter what. You know, uh, Pilate, yes, he had all of these people out here yelling at him, crucify Jesus. Now which one was right, crucify him or release him? Releasing him was what was right, but there's all the people pressuring him. And to keep the people happy, what does he do? Okay, you go ahead and crucify him. And what we have in the church is that desire to compromise truth and compromise right so that we can keep some people happy. Look at what's happened through the years when you deal with marriage, divorce, and remarriage in a congregation. So many times people, you don't need to be preaching on that because we got those so-and-so over here, and he gives a lot of money, you know, and uh, he, well, so what? Are we going to do what is right? Or are we going to just give in to the people? People don't like God's teaching concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage today. So what do we do? We keep quiet about it. I've been in places where if you ever mentioned it, it was too much. And then when I came here, I think, Brother Gallagher, if I had preached on it every week, it wouldn't have been enough. I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but uh, that was his feeling. And representing the eldership in regards to that. One, don't mention it. The other, yes, because it's God's Word and it's something that needs to be preached and taught. So what do we do? Give in to the people? Give in to all of the adulterers and adulteresses? And let them go to hell happy? Because that's what we do a lot of times. That's what a lot of congregations do. And they embrace the idea, just don't ask, don't tell. Don't tell us your marital situation, we don't want to know. Years ago, I visited someone, and all of a sudden, well, we got kicked out of their house, actually. Because you cannot question our marriage situation. You don't have a right to. Well, yes we do. Elders have the obligation to make sure. But, pressure on by keeping people happy takes priority over what is right. Why did so many congregations back in the late 1800s and early 1900s allow an instrument to be brought in 
It was not because of what was right. It was because of the popularity of it and because people liked it. Get into any discussion nowadays about where is the authority for using instrumental music in worship to God today? Well, I like it. I enjoy it. And so what happened? Congregations, elderships, just gave in to the desires of the people instead of doing what is right. And now then we have congregations, several of them, who have, they first started, a long study with prayer, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit reveals to them that it's all right to use mechanical instruments of music. And that's the way in, basically in which they announce it. And so we have decided as elders we're going to allow. And many times they'll start, well, we'll have a service that is without it, and then we'll have a service that's with it. Why? Because they give in to the desires and the wishes of people instead of leading and training and guiding congregations. We need to make the decision that we're going to do what is right at all times, not what's popular. Because what is popular is not always right. But then, as you continue in this text, our Lord then saw cruelty in the lives of the soldiers. Starting in Matthew 27 and verse 27 going through verse 31. It says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put, on, or put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. What a sad situation that these soldiers placed themselves in of simply cruelty, They had no sympathy, no tenderness, no compassion whatsoever. I might excuse them a little bit from the standpoint they were hardened soldiers. They were used to going out into battle and they had to kill the enemy. And they had become hardened as a result of that. But in reality, even though you might try and make excuses for them, there's still no sympathy, no tenderness, no compassion, only cruelty. Why didn't someone stand up? Why, this individual is a righteous individual. He's just. He has done nothing worthy of this. But they didn't. They got all the soldiers together, and they're just going to make fun of him in any way that they can. Since he was claiming to be king of the Jews, let's put a robe on him. Let's get this crown of thorns. And the thorns were not, you know, rose-type thorns that we have. They were about an inch long. And they beat that crown of thorns into his head. spit upon him. Some have said that there's no greater insult to a man than to spit on him. That's cruelty being demonstrated. Paul would write in Ephesians 4th chapter, verse 31 and 32, 
to let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. There is a tenderness, a compassion, a feeling with the feelings of other individuals that is seen in Christianity. It's not seen in the world. The world is, and talking about our meeting last week, humanistic theory or idea that is permeating our society. I'm the God. Everything revolves around me. Well, Christianity, it's not that way. There is a feeling with the feelings of others, a showing of empathy, a compassion. Peter emphasizes this in 1 Peter 3, verses 8 and verse 9. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one on another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. What a vast contrast between what Peter presents as Christianity and Christian living, being full of pity, loving as brethren, compassion, being courteous one to another with what we see in the world today. That I don't care about anyone else. I care about myself. And if you do something considerate to me, then you ought to because I'm so great. And no thanks being expressed. And if you do anything to me that's evil, if you say anything about me, you just better watch out because you're going to get double it. Now then, to a great extent, isn't that our society today? And yet Christianity is exactly the opposite of that. And he says when someone rails, you don't rail. You bless. You say good. Speak well. Why? He says, knowing that there and two were you called. We've been called to do that, to that type of a lifestyle in Christianity. The exact opposite of what the world presents. No wonder Christianity becomes appealing to the world when we live it out in our daily life. As opposed to, for example, these soldiers who express cruelty, lack of compassion, no sympathy whatsoever, no tenderness and kindness. The Christian presents all of those things to the world. And then Christ saw in gratitude in the lives of the nine lepers whom he had healed. This is presented to us in Luke, the the 17th chapter, verses 11 through verse 19. It says, And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Notice that word mercy there? What we were just talking about, the exact opposite of what the soldiers had. Have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, and with a loud voice glorified God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. 
Jesus answering said, were, or where, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Ten people healed. All of them crying out, Master, heal us. Have mercy on us. And he shows mercy toward them by healing every one of the ten. When one of them realizes he's healed, he returns to thank God, to thank our Lord. And Jesus said, weren't there ten healed? Where's the other nine? Why is it that only one out of the ten returned to give thanks, to be thankful, to show gratitude for the mercy which he wanted? and which they expressed that they had a desire for. Why aren't all of them here? They should have been returning, all ten, to give thanks, but they didn't. It seems to, that today people are not thankful. We don't express those thanks to others for what they have done. We're living more and more in a, a society and we've raised a generation, if not more, of people who think they have everything coming to them. World owes me this. World owes me that. That's one of the appeals of socialism that Brother Vaughn talked about on uh, Thursday night. world owes me this, so take it from someone else and give it to me. That type of attitude, when mercy is demonstrated toward them, why should they be thankful? with an attitude, and if they are right, that the world owes these things to me, why should I be grateful over that which you're doing? And so they're not. Because they believe they are do it. You have the obligation to do these things to me, and so when you do them, you're just fulfilling your obligation. Why should I even thank you for it? They might not go through that thought process, but that's the, the result of it. And so they are in, we see a people who are in ungrateful, ingratitude on the part of people, even as Jesus saw with these ten lepers that were healed, or at least on the part of nine of them. Paul in Colossians, the second chapter in verse 7 talks about being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Notice how the thanksgiving is tied directly to the faith. You have been rooted and built up in the faith, established in the faith. You've been taught the faith. And what's the result? Thanksgiving on your part. Skip down a few verses to chapter 3 and verse 15. To let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. We could, if we had time, just go through several passages that express the same idea. Be thankful. Because we recognize that we are but unprofitable servants. We are doing what, yes, God wants us to do. And God has 
through His marvelous grace and mercy, given His Son to die upon the cross, to suffer those things that we've talked about this morning, all of those things that He went through. For what reason? So that He might save a wretch like me. That He might save you. And it should cause within us a thankfulness on our part to a loving Heavenly Father who cares for us and wants us to be saved. But that thankfulness is really not very valuable if it is not followed up with action. An action of obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ through our faith, repenting of our sins, making a confession that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then being baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. Why? Because that one who died for us said this is what you need to do to be saved. That's thankful living. That's the beginning of that thankful life. And then that thankful life begins at that point and continues on through our life so that we are subjecting ourselves to the will of that one who gave himself for us. That King of kings and Lord of lords. And so that we live in a thankful way so that people when they see us, they see Christ living in me as Paul would write, the hope of glory. The very fact that I have, there's a glory out here and I have hope for it is only when Christ is seen in me and He's living in me. Why? Because that is thankful living. I am by my life giving thanks to God and through our, to our Lord Jesus Christ for the sacrifice that they've made. Now, if you've not obeyed that gospel of Jesus Christ this morning, we would encourage you to do those things which God has set forth to be, be saved. If you have not lived the type of life that's true thankfulness to Him, then why not repent of your sins and obey His will We'll come back unto him to be restored and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of those sins. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.